The following is a CNN special report. It's probably fair to say that few men were more admired and more hated than Malcolm X. To many, he was the voice of reason, never afraid to speak truth to power, never afraid to challenge the white establishment about the cruelty and injustice the black Americans faced. To many more, though, his efforts to end it opened more wounds than they healed. And no one was more aware of the tension around him and within him than the man himself. In 1965, after a very public split with the Nation of Islam and its leader, Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X was under constant threat. He was being closely watched by the FBI and CIA, and he said many times he knew his life would soon be over. But neither his fate nor his role in history was preordained. Malcolm X's story isn't just about how it ended, but also about who he was and why he was killed. I don't worry. I tell you, I'm a man who believed that I died 20 years ago. And I live like a man who is dead already. I have no fear whatsoever of anybody or anything. I feel as though he knew that his life was in extreme danger. Malcolm is tired, physically exhausted. He has been on the road. He has spent a lot of time trying to hold fast to his closest supporters and loyalists to get them to go along with him on this journey of his evolving ideas on religion, on race, on revolution, on self-determination. His family is under siege. There are these skirmishes between his followers and various people from the Nation of Islam. He foolishly acts like Lucifer. That's right, dear father. He times them to make war against me. There are these articles being written in the newspaper of the Muhammad Speaks condemning him as a traitor, suggesting that he is worthy of death for his betrayal and he would be met with death if it were not for the mercy of Elijah Muhammad. We were well aware that his life was in danger. The media made Malcolm this fiery, angry person when in actuality he was reacting to all of the injustice around him because he was a man of great compassion, of love. Someone who was clearly brilliant, clearly dedicated, impeccable integrity, and who was in a rush because he knew he was gonna be killed. He said, you know, I'm probably a dead man already. He felt and saw his mortality. He felt like these days ahead of him were going to be cut short. Is your life in danger from the Muslims and Elijah Muhammad's group? Well, Elijah Muhammad uh, has given the order to his followers to see that I am crippled or killed. He has given out this hearsay information that he's branded for death. I'm certain that if he was branded for death, why he would have gotten death long ago instead of having time to run around and talk about it. He knows that he is guilty of things that many men have uh, been chastised for. So his fight against the messenger is in fact a fight against the God that sent the messenger. The night of February 13th, Malcolm in his home in Queens uh, with his wife and four children was awakened by an explosion. Someone had thrown a Molotov cocktail into the windows. What really irritated him was that things had descended to the level where somebody was uh, firebombing a house with innocent sleeping children in it. If anybody can find where I bombed my house, they can put a rifle bullet through my head. It was my children and my own life and my wife's life that was at stake. It was a stressful time for him, and he still decided to press on, and so he scheduled a rally for February 21st in 1965. For the first time, to me, he looked a little down. And I don't ever remember seeing him down before, you know, even in the most dire circumstances. Chief, could you describe what happened here today? At about 3.15 p.m. Uh, this afternoon, uh, there were about 400 persons present in the ballroom here representing the, an organization known as uh, the Afro-American Unity Organization, headed up by Malcolm X. 
And Malcolm was uh, addressing the audience from the speaker's platform. And he raised his hand in uh, the Muslim greeting, Salam Aleikum, like this, his right hand. At that point, uh, rumbling broke out behind us. I heard somebody shout, kill him. Apparently, two men approached the speaker's rostrum and uh, discharged shots at him from apparently very close range. As I turned around quickly, and the next thing I saw was Malcolm falling back in a dead faint. My mother threw herself over her babies, and she yelled out, they're killing my husband. I heard shots, and I saw people crawling on the floor. I saw, and so I got down too. Then when I was looking out, and I saw um, someone um, look in amazement to the front. I knew they had shot my husband. He sustained one shot uh, in the uh, lower right chin, and the other six hit him in the uh, chest and uh, body. I looked out at him, and I said, he's going to die. I kept saying to myself, he's going to die. He's going to die. How many he immediately? No, he wasn't uh, dead immediately, uh, but uh, expired uh, very shortly. Malcolm is dead. This is this is nearly as bad as uh, when they assassinate the president of the United States. The assassination of Malcolm X was an unfortunate tragedy, and it reveals that there are still uh, numerous uh, people in our nation who have degenerated to the point of expressing dissent through murder, and uh, we haven't learned to disagree without being violently disagreeable. Now, when the best thing happened to him, he gave a whole bunch of little boys, and they grow to become a close an opportunity to be men. In that summer of 1964, J. Edgar Hoover sent a memo to his New York office that explicitly stated, quote, do something about Malcolm X. We don't know what he meant by that. You find the Negro getting drunk, he doesn't know the truth. You find the Negro taking dope, he doesn't know the truth. You find the Negro lying and cheating, he doesn't know the truth. He's usually imitating the white man. Negroes get drunk because they see white people get drunk. They smoke cigarettes because they see white people smoke cigarettes. He was such an excellent speaker, and he read a lot. He's the fastest man I ever met in my life. They commit fornication and adultery because when they turn on the television, all they see is a white man committing fornication and adultery. So, and they want to be like the white man, so they copy his immoral social habits. Malcolm Little was born into a family of activists. His parents, Earl and Louise, were active followers of Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, which was an organization that drew on the themes of Pan-Africanism and black nationalism, promoting black pride. Marcus Garvey, who said what? The world has made being black a crime. I intend to make it a virtue. That the world has said Black history is a curse, that black freedom is a pipe dream, that black hope is a joke. My father's father, Hopper Earl, was a young Garveyite. He was a minister. It was during the Jim Crow era, and he was encouraging African-American communities to be self-reliant, to be independent, uh, to stand up against uh, injustice. You know, it was during a time when lynchings were prevalent, um, to say the least. And so uh, my grandfather was um, assassinated also, tied to a t uh, the trolley tracks. Malcolm's mother, Louise, was unable to keep the family together. So she had a breakdown. Social services came and split the family up and sent Malcolm and his siblings to various foster homes. Malcolm went to a white foster home and attended a predominantly white um, elementary and, and secondary school. He was popular in school. He had charisma even, even as a child. His classmates voted for him to be class president. Most often he was the only person of color in his school. And when he was 
I think about 12 years old, he did tell his favorite teacher, Mr. Ostrowski, that he wanted to be a lawyer. And Mr. Ostrowski flatly told him that Negroes can't aspire to be no, uh, lawyers, that he should be a carpenter and use his hands. Malcolm kind of lost interest in school. His half-sister in Boston tried to get him to visit her so she could kind of get him on track. And so Malcolm went to visit Ella in Boston and was completely taken by urban culture. And was attracted to the Hepcat movement and jazz and the dancing and the clothes and the fashion and he gradually adopted this persona that became known as Detroit Red. And as Detroit Red, Malcolm drifted um, further away from the Garvey roots of his family into, you know, um, petty crime. He was a gangster. He was a hustler. And so those early years did expose him to some of the darker precincts of the black condition. Malcolm hatched a plan to engage in a series of breaking and enterings. Malcolm made the error of taking some of the merchandise to a pawn shop. When he went back to retrieve the watch, uh, it was a watch, the police were there to arrest him. While Malcolm is in prison, his family intervenes. His family had not given up on him. His brother began preaching to him, and, and I think preached really stridently to Malcolm. You know, well, we have found these teachings of Islam. They remind us of what our parents taught us in terms of black people need to do for self, need to support their own institutions, need to be morally upright. Elijah Muhammad almost became like a surrogate father to him. And he truly believed in the work that Elijah Muhammad was doing. And, and it was very similar to the work that his father was doing. I thank Allah for you who are always willing to go anywhere that I go. I was in prison. Uh, I was a very wayward, criminal, backward, illiterate, uneducated, and whatever other negative uh, characteristics you can think of type of person until I heard the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And because of the impact that it had upon me in giving me a desire to reform myself and rehabilitate myself for the first time in my life and also being able to see the effect that it had upon others, this is what made me accept it. It was the love of Elijah Muhammad in that cell and no folk that transformed him from Malcolm Little, the gangster, until Malcolm X, the greatest truth teller that we've known about the black condition in the 20th century. Prior to hearing what he teaches, I had no interest whatsoever in anything serious or any kind of educational pursuits. When Malcolm came out of prison in 1952, he, you know, met Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad invited him to stay with him, so Malcolm studied with him for a period of time. something about Malcolm. Some people just have this kind of magnetism. When they walk into a room, everyone starts focusing on them. So Malcolm just had this kind of charisma. He knew how to talk to people. He could speak to them in a way that made things very clear. It was easy to believe in what he was saying, because I was living it every day. America was in the middle of the so-called civil rights movement. If you're going to talk about him, you have to understand that very clearly. There are people being literally murdered, hung from trees. In the southern states of this country, there was terrorism going on. Shot, arrested. That's the only way you can describe it, terrorism. People were being killed, bombed out of their homes. Having dogs sick on him. If a dog is biting a black man, the black man should kill the dog. When that black man is doing nothing but trying to take advantage of what the government says is supposed to be his, then that black man should kill that dog or any two-legged dog who sicks the dog on him. 
Malcolm X did something that was very rare in the history of black leadership. Every mention of the word integration by whites. He viewed white fears, insecurities, and anxieties as an afterthought. Whether it be from the mouth of Kennedy. Most black leaders have to deal with white fears, insecurities, and anxieties in order to get about. On down to the mouth of the lowest, raggediest white liberal in the street. Malcolm viewed white fears, insecurities, and anxieties as tertiary. What was at the center was black suffering. What was at the center was the need for black awakening. We believe that separation is the best way and the only sensible way, not integration. That pits him radically against the mainstream in white America. Malcolm could speak in a way that resonated with people in those settings. There is nothing that the white man will ever do to bring about uh, true, sincere citizenship or civil rights recognition for black people in this country. Nothing will they ever do. They will always talk it, but they won't practice it. What is your real name? Malcolm. Malcolm X. Uh, is that your legal name? As far as I'm concerned, it's my legal name. They were just not used to a black man speaking the way he did. Have you been to court to establish the I don't. I, I didn't have to go to court to be called Murphy or Jones or Smith. A group of Negro dissenters is taking to street corner stepladders, church pulpits, sports arenas, and ballroom platforms across the United States to preach a gospel of hate that would set off a federal investigation if it were preached by Southern whites. I referred to the popular belief that the Muslims preach a hatred for the white race. You do not subscribe to this. No, uh, I've never heard the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teach or preach hatred for anyone. He, he preaches hatred against evil. Malcolm was a lightning rod because he was articulating and giving voice to an alternative political strategy. We are for separation, not, not segregation. For many white people, there's something what they call an uppity black man. That's a black man who does not accept the position that they have decided that he should have in this country. Segregation, as we're taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, is that which is forced upon inferiors by superiors. To them, Brother Malcolm was an uppity black man, and, uh, and they despised him for it. Separation is done voluntarily by two equals. We taught us to hate ourselves, one of his favorite subjects. And he was talking about how what we knew of the history of the world was incorrect. Who taught you to hate the color of your skin to such extent that you bleach to get like the white man? Who taught you to hate the shape of your nose and the shape of your lips? Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? Who taught you to hate your own kind? Who taught you to hate the race that you belong to? I began to follow him. I began to listen. I began to read books that he said. I began to understand and believe in, and he gave me a perception on how to view this country. It seemed to me been preaching hate to meet hate. Uh, I don't advocate any kind of hate. He absolutely believed in the Nation of Islam. He thought that that was one organization that would help to get black people back on their feet. My dear beloved brothers and sisters. Someday the Negro is going to wake up and try and do unto whites as the whites have done unto us. But it also pits him against the mainstream in black America. That's why he, he had so much trouble with most of the black leaders of his day. Martin Luther King teaches Negroes to love all white people, no matter what they do to you. And the same whites whom he teaches Negroes to love stick dogs on him, uh, stick dogs on their children, dogs on their women, and dogs on their babies. So that when he looks at America, he looks at the record. Whereas most of the white mainstream and black mainstream leadership in the 40s and 50s look at America full of promise and possibility. Malcolm X is exactly the opposite. King's talking about a dream in 63. Malcolm's talking about a nightmare. It means that no matter what the Negro does, he is not going to get along with white. So I think that Mr. Muhammad's whole philosophy is more intelligent than Mr. King's. 
He was not someone who would hold his tongue in criticizing the preacher class, right? The black religious leadership. Today's gathering is the largest in Washington's history. He was very critical of established black leaders. In the van is Martin Luther King. And of their strategies. And so many people shied away from him because of that. Malcolm was very critical and dismissive at the time when people were somewhat celebratory at the success of the March on Washington. Later, Mr. King and the other leaders are to go to the White House, where the president said that everyone must be impressed with the demonstration of the throng's faith and confidence in our democratic form of government. Malcolm came as an observer and he called it the farce on Washington, an event that had been co-opted by the government, that had been co-opted by labor, that leaders of the civil rights movement had been essentially bought off. I think the support uh, reflects a desire on the part of our people in this country to try a new approach, a new analysis, a new method, a new approach to get a solution now, not 10 years from now. But Martin's response to Malcolm was very much like many of our response to Malcolm, which was, here is somebody who was saying in public, what black people often said in private, just how ugly and how vicious and how barbaric the treatment of black people had been. We're also taught that at any time, anyone, in any way, uh, inflicts or seeks to inflict violence upon us. We are within our religious rights to retaliate in self-defense to the maximum degree of our ability. As Malcolm became popular, these are parrots that have been put in front of the Negro community. In a public outside of the Nation of Islam. This increased tensions by any means necessary inside the Nation of Islam. Try a new approach. People in the media began identifying him as the leader, or as a leader, or as the heir apparent. This was threatening to a full range of people in the Nation of Islam who maybe wanted to be the heir apparent. A theological space was widening between Malcolm and Elijah. You know, Malcolm, wherever he spoke, Muslims would come up to him and say, you know, this is not Islam. What you're teaching is not Islam. Islam does not see race. Islam is colorblind. Um, the way that you view Elijah Muhammad as a prophetic figure is, is counter to, to Islam. In the name of Allah, the most Christ. And then another piece of this, of course, was um, Malcolm finding out about Elijah Muhammad's domestic life. Leave us alone if you don't like us. Leave us alone. When Malcolm found out that Elijah Muhammad had fathered these children outside of his marriage to Clara, many of these women were women who had worked for Elijah Muhammad in some capacity as a secretary or, 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 or other way. Malcolm did have a blind faith in the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who had so fundamentally loved him, rescued him from the muck and from the mud. And that blind faith was shattered and he went into emotional shock. This was the straw that, that broke the camel's back, so to speak, in terms of Malcolm's um, faith in Elijah Muhammad as a, a model, as a moral leader. His rendezvous with grim destiny begins a little after noontime. Death is less than one short hour away. On November 22nd, 1963... But apparently something is wrong here. Something is terribly wrong. John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And the first unconfirmed report say the president was hit in the head. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Two o'clock Eastern Standard Time. As Malcolm felt himself growing estranged from Elijah Muhammad and from the Nation of Islam, Malcolm and the Muslims in New York had planned a major event 
The president's body is met by a cordon of servicemen. Elijah Muhammad was scheduled to speak. After Kennedy's assassination, Elijah was like, no, I'm not doing any public speaking. I'm canceling that event. And the ministers in the Nation of Islam were instructed to not comment on Kennedy's assassination. Malcolm gave the speech. He did not comment on the assassination. Well, you see, it was very clear that Elijah Muhammad always wanted to steer clear of any confrontation. When Malcolm opened up to question and answer, the reporter asked him what his thoughts were on Kennedy's assassination. And Malcolm, you know, he gave this really thoughtful response about violence. He said, when you have a climate of hate, you're going to get back hate. So if we're putting out so much hate and we're teaching our children uh, and our nation to hate, then you're going to get all of that back. He said, this is a case of chickens coming home to roost. He was speaking for himself and not Muslim in general. And Minister Malcolm has been suspended from public speaking for the time being. So when he attacked the U.S. nation state in the form of you've got violence in your history has now come back visited on your young darling, John F. Kennedy. That was the worst thing that he could have said from a life point of view. While this was happening, Cassius Clay was training for his upcoming championship fight with Sonny Liston. Cassius Clay had been exposed to the Nation of Islam. He invited Malcolm to come to Miami for a vacation. He, like, he knew like Malcolm was on this period of silence, said, bring your family. My father was his mentor, his spiritual guide. Cassius wins the fight. Malcolm makes a few statements to the press, so he kind of violates his silence. I've been silent for the past 90 days because of uh, some statements I made concerning the President of the United States, uh, which were distorted. They were distorted. And yes. And what did you say, and, Malcolm? Well, I said the same thing that everybody says, that uh, his assassination was the result of the climate of hate. But only, I, only, only I said the chickens came home to roost, and which means the same thing. But did you, did, you did not say that you were glad the President was killed. No, that's what the press said. Uh -huh a couple days later would have been Savior's Day, which was the Nation of Islam's annual convention. Malcolm thought he would, you know, be allowed to come to Savior's Day and maybe speak, and this would be the period of reconciliation. He thought, I have Cassius Clay, he's ready to join publicly. He just won the World Heavyweight Championship. The world is looking at him. Cassius Clay is invited to Savior's Day. So I was a Muslim, and if it wasn't for Andre Elijah Muhammad, I'd where he's given a prominent, you know, place in the program. This is a golden Muslim mosque that was presented to me by the Islamic Council of All Egypt. Malcolm isn't invited. Malcolm isn't asked to speak. He pretty much feels shut out. He would say over and over again, any religion that does not allow me to be in power to speak and work on behalf of the freedom of black people, I'll let that religion go. And basically, you know, said, you know, I'm, I'm about to leave the Nation of Islam. This, of course, was met with great anger and resentment by many in the Nation of Islam. Muslims have uh, excommunicated Malcolm X and we're done with him unless he wants to come back into line with the teachings and the moral principles of Islam and a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So when I found out he was out, I knew something was wrong. So I called him up the next day. And then he came over and we spent the whole day talking. And once it was decided, we knew they wouldn't let him back. We said we have to set up an organization to do what we can for black folks. While all this is happening, Malcolm is in need of a recentering of himself, spiritually, politically, and he decided to make the pilgrimage to Mecca. Well, he had seen it before. There was something about 64 where he was seeing the same thing. He was just seeing it through different eyes. He had already seen black and white people come together. He just was still tied to a blind faith in Elijah so he didn't allow it to penetrate his soul. He realized how much of Islam he, he didn't know ritually. The 
actual experience of the ritual was overwhelming and transformative. Since I went to Mecca and uh, reported that uh, the religion of Islam is a religion of brotherhood, which includes all mankind, it caused a great deal of wrath in the heart and mind of Elijah Muhammad, who has been teaching that uh, the white race is a race of devils. The tensions at home are amping up with the nation of Islam, in part because of some of Malcolm's words, right? And he, the, the attention he's receiving um, from law enforcement, from the FBI domestically, from the CIA internationally, is also increasing. But he also knows that the nation of Islam is very upset with him. Why are they threatening your life? Well, uh, primarily because they're afraid that I will tell the real reason that they've been, that I'm out of the black Muslim movement, which I never told. I kept to myself. But the real, real reason is that Elijah Muhammad, the head of the movement, is the father of eight children by six different teenage girls. Different, uh, six different teenage girls who were his private personal secretary. We formed a group known as the Organization of Afro-American Unity. It's non-religious, number one. Any Negro can belong to it. And the objective of, the, of that organization is to bring about a condition that will guarantee respect and recognition of the 22 million black Americans as human beings. Now, this and, is very and, laudable, but how? Well, by any means necessary. It was an incredibly high-pressure time for Malcolm. As Malcolm's mind was expanding, as his worldview was expanding, the space that he was occupying was shrinking. Valentine's Day, a Molotov cocktail is thrown into the nursery of our home, my parents' home, where my father's four babies uh, slept, and my mother, of course, was pregnant with the twins. I became frightened for him and his family because this was the first time that I can recall that there was a direct attack, not only on him, but on his family. If you attack me, that's one thing. I know what to do when you start attacking me. But when you attack sleeping babies while you are lower than a gun. That's actually where that picture of my father with the rifle came from. He couldn't get protection. And he said, if I can't get anyone to protect me as a citizen, that I have a rifle and I will protect my family. It was a stressful time for him, and he still decided to press on, and so he scheduled a rally for February 21st in 1965. He was going to give the formal unfolding of the OAAU platform and plan of action. When he arrived near the Audubon, he parked his car about two blocks away, didn't let us know he was arriving, and he walked up Broadway to the Audubon. He just made himself a perfect target, and he knew better. He saw me and he said, Brother Peter, when you get a chance, come backstage, I want to talk to you. And I went out and checked my equipment, made sure I finished my setup, taped the microphone, jumped and all that. Then I came back in, he said he wanted me to go and make a phone call. He said, do any of you know what Reverend Milton Galamison looked like? And I said, I do. So he said to me, he said, well, go out, go out front, and when he comes in, bring him backstage. So I said, okay. He knew what I actually did, photography and recording, but he insisted that I go make this telephone call. And I, I tried to explain to him, I have to get this stuff set up. He just stopped and looked right at me and said, brother, I want you to go and make the phone call. I sat in the front row I think I was uh, third from the aisle. He insisted I get out of there to go out completely out of the building where the telephone booth was. And while I was in the booth, he steps out there. I heard Brother Malcolm say, Assalamu alaikum. Somebody shouted, get your hand out of my pocket, very loud. And then a little bit of a tussle, and Malcolm responded by holding a hand up, something like, hold on, hold on there, brothers. 
while I was in the telephone booth, I heard the shots. I ran into the, to the Audubon ballroom, and people were running out by this time, and they were screaming and crying and cursing. My mother put her body on top of us. She covered her, her babies because there was all the shooting. I don't know how many uh, shooters are in there. I mean, this is while the smell of gun smoke is still in the air. I'm crawling to a phone. My mind is focused on doing my job. I am at the Audubon Ballroom. Pandemonium is the only word that I can use to describe the scene here. I was sitting in the first row when Malcolm came on the stage and greeted the audience with his traditional salam alaikum, a Muslim greeting. As soon as he said that, several persons, it happened so quickly, I, I can't describe them, stood up and fired shots. You can see a crowd over Malcolm up on the stage where I ran down to the left-hand side of the building up on the stage. I still had my camera with me and I kept right on shooting pictures. Someone had opened his shirt and I saw all these bullet holes in his body. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, he's gonna die because he was gasping. I wish it had never happened. It was the saddest moment of my life. God, we failed it. I was trying to help. I started talking to everybody I could to have them reiterate from their perspective what had just happened and what they thought about it. I heard the shots, I ran forward. I saw Malcolm hold his side and hold his stomach and fell down. How do you feel now? I want to kill somebody. That's right, I want to kill somebody. Before the night's over, if Malcolm dies, somebody gonna die. Well, it was a certain uh, noise, and then um, the two fellas, one was a black Muslim, and I don't know who the other one was because I didn't see him, ran and started shooting, and everybody fell to the floor. Yes, sir. They were black Muslims. Yes, sir. They were black Muslims. Was I recognized? He saved my life. But had, had he not sent me out, I would have been standing by the tape recorder that went my back to the audience. When they started shooting, I would have been shot in the back. Then the brothers had gone and bogarted a, a stretcher from Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, which is right across the street. They just took a stretcher. They put him on the stretcher and rolled it out back over to the hospital. The only person that was caught at the scene was Talmadge Hare. I believe if Hare had not been shot in the leg and had not been beaten up by those who loved my father, that he would not have ever been arrested that he would have gone free just like the rest of the real killers were. The evidence points to the fact that Hare was the only person convicted for Malcolm X's assassination that had a part in it. Malcolm uh, is the victim of his own preaching. He preached Wallace, and so he became the victim of it. Norman Butler and Thomas Johnson, Hayer initially identified them as co-conspirators. He later would recant his testimony. They weren't apprehended at the scene. There's no physical evidence that connected them to the assassination. It was all circumstantial. No one remembered seeing them there. Clearly, he posed a threat to the government. He posed a threat to the nation of Islam. He posed you know, it's just all so unfortunate. You do not personally feel that anyone, uh, any member of the Brotherhood of Islam committed this crime? No, no, we, we, don't, we don't do a thing like that. That summer of 1964, J. Edgar Hoover sent a memo to his New York office that explicitly stated, quote, do something about Malcolm X. We don't know what he meant by that. There are thousands of pages of classified FBI files that have yet to be revealed for us to know. There is no doubt that the afterlife of Malcolm X has had more impact than his life.
people began to see the truths he told, the love he displayed, the courage he exemplified, the visions for the oneness of humanity that he was after. What was Silas was a man, a black man, who had thoroughly studied the system that exists in this country, who understood it very clearly, and who was developing a cohesive plan to deal with it. There will come a time when black people wake up and become intellectually independent enough to think for themselves. His voice predicted the urban rebellions in Watts and throughout the nation in 1968. His voice predicted the growing frustrations that African Americans would feel as the civil rights progress is slow to a halt. He predicted the ongoing troubles with police brutality, the growing frustration of black youth who had almost given up. Malcolm was a young man when the world learned about him. He was just in his 20s. And he was killed at 39. And, and you know, this man made a significant impact all around the world in just 12 short years. What attracted me most, we knew we could trust him. No matter where our operation went or whatever happened, he wouldn't have backed us. If we came in together, we were all going to go out together.